All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, we will get started momentarily. We're just gonna let, give, give a minute or two to get everybody into the webinar. So just be, we'll be right with you here in a couple minutes. All right, good evening, everyone. If you're just now joining us, uh, we're just like getting in a couple minutes to get all of our audience participants in to the webinar. So just uh, bear with us for another minute. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Tiger Talk today. Today, we're gonna be um, uh, discussing health and wellness resources for students. Uh, we're excited to be with you today and we have a good program uh, for you um, and hope you're doing well as we head into uh, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, my name is Josh Barnes and I work here in student affairs and uh, specifically with orientation and family programs here at Clemson. Um, and I wanna welcome you to um, our Tiger Talk this evening. Um, so today um, we're going to be going over, we'll do a welcome and overview of the session. We'll introduce our campus experts who will be presenting to you today. Uh, we'll do the presentation uh, followed by questions and answers. Um, and then we'll wrap up with some closing remarks um, towards the end of the session. Uh, today's Tiger Talk uh, is centered around health and wellness resources. Um, available to your students. Um, wellness, wellness is a, an important element to the overall success of your student. Um, and so the university is committed to, to providing um, resources to help with student well being. And so today you'll be hearing specifically from advocacy and success, healthy campus, and counseling and psychological services, or what we call here on campus, CAPS. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, of course, this is a Zoom webinar, which means that. All video and audio lines have been muted, um, and that's just to ensure a quality experience and so that our, our panelists can um, present to you and, uh, and provide a good experience for you all in the audience. Um, and, and I should note that this is being recorded and this will be available for future viewing inside the Clemson Parent and Family Experience Portal within the next three business days. It does take us a few days uh, because we do have to go back and edit the video and, and, and add closed captioning uh, for accessibility purposes. Uh, so just bear with us as we uh, work through that, um, and we'll get that uh, next week posted on our uh, in the portal and on our website. There is a question and answer feature. It is a uh, if you look on your bar, uh, there should be a toolbar across the top or bottom of your screen. Uh, there is a Q and A uh, with word bubbles, uh, and that's where you can ask uh, your questions for uh, our panelists today. Um, questions should we do ask that questions remain relevant to the topic, which again is student health and wellness resources. Um, if you have other questions, uh, we do, you can, at, you can reach out to us at cufamilies at clemson.edu and we will be glad to, to answer those questions offline. I also wanna note that we do know that the university uh, sent out um, updated COVID-19 guidelines uh, last week. Please note that these panelists are not necessarily the experts to be answering COVID-19 related questions. So you can send those to CU families and we'll try to do our best to get uh, you connected to the appropriate people. Um, again, our, um, our, our topic today is for health and wellness resources that are generally available to students, regardless uh, if we're in a pandemic or not. So um, with that being said, um, we will get right into our presentation. And before we do that, please know if we do have technical experiences that we ask you to be patient, we'll do our best to work through those, but you never know when you're on a virtual setting in Zoom, 
uh, what kind of technical issues you may run into, but we'll do our best to get those back up and running um, for you as we move on. And so with that, um, I want to take some time to introduce our panelists. I'll let them introduce uh, themselves to you. So up first is Dr. Kimberly Poole. Good evening or afternoon, depending on where you're at. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to speaking with you. I serve as our Senior Associate Dean of Students within the Division of Student Affairs, and one of the departments I have the pleasure of working directly with is our Office of Advocacy and Success, and so um, we'll hear about our department. Um, one of our staff members, Alana Landreth, is going to um, do the presentation, but I will be here for questions and answers or anything that you may need from us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Kimberly. Up next is Alana Landreth. So hi, everyone. I'm Alana Landreth, and I am one of the assistant directors in the Office of Advocacy and Success, or OAS, as we refer to it sometimes. And I'm one of the newer staff members, but I've been at Clemson for 17 years, and I've also uh, lived in the Clemson area most of my life. So I'm very uh, familiar with campus and community resources, and it's great to meet you all. Thank you, Alana. All right, Jennifer. Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Gorey, and I'm the director of Healthy Campus. And we are the health promotion, health education, risk reduction arm, if you will, of the Student Health Center. So I work very closely with CAPS and the medical providers to help ensure that the campus environment is as safe, healthy, and sustainable as possible. And I'm looking forward to speaking with you tonight. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Dr. Gaynor. Hi, my name is Dr. Verma Gaynor. I am currently the interim director for counseling and psychological services. Um, I've been employed in various places on campus, but uh, keep coming back to working with students in mental health. Uh, our previous director retired at the end of February and I am serving as the interim um, probably until the beginning of next year and hope to be able to answer all of your questions regarding um, some of the issues and support that you're looking for on campus. Also a Clemson alum. Excellent. Excellent, thank you. All right, thank you uh, for those introductions. And at this point, we will turn it over to Alana for advocacy and success. Great, thank you, Josh. Okay, so we're gonna start with the Office of Advocacy and Success and talk a little bit more about many of the resources that we offer. I'd like to first start with our departmental overview. So the purpose of this office is to serve all current Clemson students as a trusted place for care, advocacy, and referrals to campus and communities partners. And we're going to talk more about those resources in just a few minutes. This office works to inspire an individual sense of belonging, student success, and retention. We partner with students, their families, campus and community partners, faculty and staff to empower our students to achieve academic and personal success and to build resilience. So as you can see, we work with many different areas of campus uh, to empower students with that student success. So now we're gonna talk about the CARE Network. The CARE Network is a program facilitated by the Office of Advocacy and Success, and it provides electronic and face-to-face -face care, support, and guidance for students experiencing issues of concern. We have a lot of different ways that we receive referrals. We receive referrals from faculty and staff. We see them from students and parents, and then we also have students to refer themselves sometimes to the CARE Network. The CARE system is an electronic portal and it houses this information and it's a software system called Maxient. Approved staff and administrators can enter, read and update. And the system enables the Office of Advocacy and Success in an integrated approach to track a student's well-being, behavior and university resource support. So it really helps us to see what we've done so far, what our next steps are gonna be and then a streamlined approach so that we can best serve students. It's also interesting to note that this last school year, we had 1,961 cases open as part of the CARE Network. So the CARE Network is managed, of course, as we said, through OAS, and it's an entry point. So it's important to stop there and talk about what an entry point means. 
because as an entry point, it means that we receive that concern and then we reach out to the student, but then it's up to the student to engage with us and have that meeting with us. It's also then as we talk with the student and make recommendations and referrals, it's then up to that student to decide if they're going to use those resources. So there's a, several different kinds of services and issues that we receive through the care network. The first one is academic concerns. And there's a few things that we see under academic concerns. The first thing is attendance and engagement. Maybe students may not be attending class like they should. Maybe they're not engaging in class in the way that the professor needs them to engage. They may not be reporting when they're expected, whether that's a, some sort of um, group project or something like that, or they may just need additional academic support for their own academic progress. They also may have adjustment issues. That may be homesickness, that may be making friends, getting used to campus life, and just really uh, giving them resources and support on how to adjust to being on campus. Then we have career or graduation resources. This can be a lot of different things as well. It could be that the student's considering changing their major, or maybe they have questions about resumes and interviews. They may be looking for a job, or they may have questions about how they're uh, tracking as far as graduation is concerned, and we help support those areas. We also have concerns about death or grief when students experience um, the loss of a friend, family member, and sometimes even a fellow student, and we provide resources for that as well. There can be a lot of different financial concerns that we receive with financial concerns that can have to do with housing, it can be access to food, it can have to do with scholarships or uh, student loans or even payments for financials. Then we also have personal health or wellness resources. Uh, this can be everything from um, stress, mental health, physical health, and many of the other things that you're gonna hear about tonight. Um, and we help refer students for those needs as well. And we also have rela uh, relationships or student engagement. And of course, there's many different relationships, whether that's friends, family, uh, roommates, and all those things, and we help support that. And those are just a few. There are all, uh, actually many other concerns that we see as well. So then we have a lot of common resources and referrals, although everything on this page is not everything that we refer to, but it is certainly a lot of the common things that we talk about in our care meetings with students. Of course, there's Redfern Health Center, and that is for medical concerns. And then we have Counseling and Psychological Services, or CAPS, and Healthy Campus, which you'll be hearing more about here in just a few minutes. Then we have Student Accessibility Services, or SAS as we call it, and this is for student accommodation requests. And this can include many different things. I'll name just a few, things like you know, uh, additional testing time, uh, quiet testing, um, that may be transportation related. There's many different things that student accessibility services um, can offer as a resource. The graduate school um, also offers their own student success staff for graduate students. Then the Office of Undergraduate Studies is a great resource. They all answer questions about policies um, and student policies, also things like medical withdrawals and academic forgiveness and many different things um, that they help support. Then the Academic Success Center is one of our more popular resources that we talk a lot with students about. Academic Success Center offers tutoring and workshops. They have academic coaching um, and coaches can work with students on semester plans from week to week. They can talk about um, individualized things like stress management, organizational management, um, time management, all kinds of different things related to academics. And then there's student financial aid and student financial services. For student financial aid being more about scholarships and loans, and then student financial services being more about payments. And then Center for Student Leadership and Engagement, which you're hearing a lot about. 
throughout your time at orientation as orientation is part of the center. And we also refer a lot of students when we talked about adjustment and engagement and things like student organizations and different events that are happening on campus and helping get them connected. Then there's the registrar's office and the registrar's office is a great resource for um, class registration questions, degree progress, all those kinds of things. The Office of Community and Ethical Standards or OCS as we call it, um, they are a great resource if a student is needing to file a conduct report, they have questions about the student code of conduct, or perhaps they're involved in some way in a conduct process, they can ask questions through OCES. Then there's the Office of Access and Equity. Uh, one of those resources is the Title IX office. And then the Center for Career and Professional Development, I mentioned them a little bit ago, but they have a lot of great resources. Um, they can even help with things like career coaching, uh, interviews, resumes, and I'm sure you'll hear much more about that through the orientation process as well. Housing and residential living is another great resource, of course, for on-campus resources and housing. And then Clemson University Ombudsman, that's a neutral place for students to go for things like conflict management, and to really talk through something if they're having some kind of issue on campus, say it's a professor, an advisor, many other situations, and they just need someone that's a neutral place to talk to, um, the Ombudsman is a great resource for that. Then there's the Clemson University Paw Pantry, and the Paw Pantry is a great resource for access to food. And then there's academic affairs leadership, and that can mean a lot of different things when we're talking with students. If a student is needing to, perhaps they're not able to reach an advisor or a professor, or they have a concern about a process, and they want to take that to the next level and figuring out what, who are the leadership folks in that area that I need to speak with, and sometimes we can ask questions about that. Although it's important to note that we can't advise on academic policies, but we can help students get connected with the folks that can advise on those policies. And then of course there is campus recreation and campus recreation is great for virtual in-person and outdoor um, recreational um, facilities and, and things like that. So our contact information, we are located on the second floor of the Hendricks Student Center. And we also have information for interpersonal violence response coordination, and that is at 307 Serene Hall. And we've included a link to our website, and our website has a full list of a lot of different resources and information for you to see. And then we also have a link to the CARE Network and the report uh, for reporting CARE concerns. Excellent. Alana, thank you so much uh, for that uh, presentation. Uh, if you have questions for Alana or regarding advocacy success, now is a great time to start to, to put those in the Q&A box. Uh, we do have two questions that have already come in. Um, so Alana, um, I'll just read the questions here and if you don't mind uh, taking a, a stab at the answer here. So how does the CARE Network know a student has not been attending a class? Is attendance monitored somehow? If so, is that true for large lectures and small labs and courses as well? Mm -hmm. So we know when we, since we receive care network concerns through the care network, that would be a care and concern that we receive from someone. So it might be a professor that notices that a student has been, hasn't been attending class. That could even be a fellow student that notices that one of their friends or one of their students hasn't been attending class. So we can receive that information um, a few different ways. Uh, and then we begin to reach out to that student to see how they're doing and what support that we can offer them. Okay, excellent. And another and question. I would, Josh, I'm sorry if I could just add exactly what Alana said. And I just would encourage you all to have dialogue and communication with your students and ensure that they're reading their syllabi because the attendance policy and what's expected and how each professor will do that um, really is laid out there. But we do sometimes become aware um, to share the various means. And so um, we are following up on the ones we're made aware of. We are not monitoring and the attendance policy can vary by class. So encourage your students to engage um, with their syllabus and their professor. 
And I would add to you after when Kimberly said that is that a lot of students not checking their emails. That's what we see a lot is professors are reaching out, but they not, may not be receiving that message. It may come through Canvas, the academic system, or through email. So also encourage your students to check their emails and be watching for communication from professors as well as from other areas of campus and make sure that they're responding to university offices and professors. Excellent, thank you, um, Alana. And I will also note, I meant to mention this in the Q&A, the way the Q&A works is that you can type a question in and, and you're not gonna see all the questions that are coming in until they're answered. It's just the kind of the way the system works. Um, so I see a couple of tests, people trying to, I think, trying to try it out and they're not seeing it, but it's in there. Uh, so uh, as we move forward, just type that in there, we'll get it um, answered. Um, the next question is, are these services available to bridge students? Okay, so the CARE Network is available to bridge students. We do speak with bridge students and offer resources to them. I think it's important to note that bridge students, as far as access to certain services at Clemson that can be a little different for bridge students, but we do offer bridge students those resources according to um, their status and as a student. Excellent, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so many students, and that's the question is, many students are often embarrassed to reach out for help. How do you promote uh, the Student Success Center to make sure it's not taboo? Yeah, and, and that is a, a good point. So what we try to do is we have a lot of outreach events. And so we try to make ourselves um, available on campus. We may um, do things, especially, you know, according to COVID and those procedures and all of that. Um, but we do try to go and speak with different groups, educate leaders, um, and then try to be out on campus when we can and it's safe to do so to interact with students so that we can talk more about the care network and so they feel more comfortable to plot to do that. Um, we do also have the option of offering um, anonymous concerns, although it is great when we know who the referral source is so that we, in case we need to ask some questions, but we do offer that as well. If folks are not uncomfortable, we do want to hear from them. So we offer that as well. Okay. All right, excellent. Um, I do want to uh, just make sure we get all the presentation in. So if you've asked a question and we haven't gotten to it, uh, don't worry, we will either come back to it if we have time or we will follow up with you individually and answer your question. You will get your questions answered uh, tonight if we're not able to get them um, in the live session. So we will move um, along just for the sake of time. Um, and we're gonna turn it over to um, Jennifer for Healthy Campus. Thanks, Josh. Um, if we go to the next slide. So I'm just gonna give you an overview of what we do with Healthy Campus. As I mentioned before, we are uh, the public health, health education, risk reduction arm of the Student Health Center. We strive for Clemson University to be a national model of health, safety, and sustainability, and for our students to experience a way of life at Clemson that contributes to their lifelong health and well-being. And that's, that's really important. We want them to uh, leave Clemson as a healthier person uh, than they would have been had they gone to a different university. So we achieve this by providing exemplary leadership and advocacy for public health policies and structures intended to improve health. We provide engaged learning activities, which include things like creative inquiry teams, internships, and help with class projects. We also provide partnerships um, and foster networks of collaborators to achieve our objectives. And we do a, a number of population level interventions that address some of the higher risk areas for college students, such as alcohol and other drug misuse, interpersonal violence prevention, and mental health with an emphasis on suicide prevention. Next slide, please. So um, we uh, do, presentations, educational sessions, um, and also health marketing campaigns on topics such as the ones listed here. So as I mentioned before, alcohol and other drug misuse prevention is a very um, significant area of focus for us. We also look at anxiety, body image, building social connections, depression, eating disorders, interpersonal violence prevention, mental health in general, 
nutrition, we have programs around social media and internet use, sexual health, sleep, that should be on two different lines, um, stress, uh, suicide prevention, sustainability, tobacco, and other health-related topics. Next slide. One of the things that all of your students will uh, participate in is a program called Aspire to Be Well. Uh, it is a 90-minute peer-led health and safety-focused dialogue that covers areas that are key to maintaining a healthy and safe campus. They include uh, the topics of overall well-being, alcohol and other drug misuse prevention, mental health and suicide prevention, and interpersonal violence prevention. Students will gain an understanding of campus resources and learn how to help others in need through risk reduction strategies and bystander intervention. So all new students must sign up and attend one of these sessions to fulfill the CU 1000 requirement. All session sign up information will be sent to their, to their email account, their at clemson.edu email account. Um, and this fall, all sessions will be held virtually via Zoom. Um, if you have questions about Aspire, you can email at us at our Aspire email account. Um, I think this session is a really important um, session for students, for, for you as their family members to talk with them about really engaging in this session because it does provide information from their peers um, about the resources that they have available to them in at Clemson on campus. Um, and also how to, to look out for each other and what um, they should, should be concerned about for help, including accessing the CARE network or accessing CARE um, or CAPS. Um, so it's, it's a, a very important session that they need to pay particular attention to. Next slide, please. We do also have some specific well-being initiatives for this fall. We um, train all of our uh, resident assistants, many of our academic advisors, uh, faculty members in a program called Tigers Together, which is a suicide prevention training program uh, that helps, helps empower advocates to reach out to students who may be experiencing emotional difficulties or crises and know how to get them to the resources that they need. So this is really a comprehensive suicide prevention program uh, that many of our students uh, will, will be trained to be advocates for. In addition to that, we have a KORU mindfulness course. Um, it's a four week class on mindfulness. It was created um, and researched and evaluated at Duke. Um, and we have this available to our students for free here on campus um, as just one ad additional well being uh, option for our students to take part in this fall. Next slide, please. We also uh, provide and, in some cases, require students to participate in other initiatives. The first one being alcohol EDU, uh, which the students should complete this summer before they even arrive. Um, this is a, a program that is specific to alcohol and other drugs, um, and it helps students understand their risks, uh, understand uh, the resources available to them, and have a better understanding how to reduce risks associated with alcohol consumption. Um, and that is required, uh, as is the Aspire to Be Well session. Both of those are required sessions for our students to take. Then we offer things that students can choose to participate in, such as our empathy workshops, uh, the body, Peer Body Project is a program uh, about positive body image that students can enroll in. Uh, we do Wellness Wednesdays and Be Well Wednesdays that are um, sessions that are well-being focused sessions that students can just choose to drop in any Wednesday of the semester um, and that focus on different well-being topics. The Core Mindfulness uh, group that I mentioned before is a four week session that delves a little bit more deeply into mindfulness um, and has a great success uh, rate for students who are struggling with anxiety or students that are having uh, would like 
to learn a little bit more about mindfulness uh, and as a way to help them do better in school or feel a little bit more like they're living the full and uh, present life in the present moment. Um, then we also have offered well-being book clubs where students um, get together with a facilitator from the library, maybe another student facilitator, one of our staff members to discuss a book related to well-being. Next slide, please. We do really work hard to make sure that our website is a go-to resource for our students. We introduce our website to our students in the Aspire to Be Well session and help them know how to access this information when they need it. Because one thing we do know is that students oftentimes don't pay the most attention to their health and well-being resources until they're at the stage that they find that they really need them. So we wanna make it such that that information is easily um, discoverable and that they know how to get back to it in, in case they need it in uh, times of crisis or just in moments when they feel like they'd like a little more information about health related topics. So our website is a really um, uh, vibrant resource for our students to utilize. Next slide. We also provide a monthly Student Health 101 electronic newsletter that's emailed to all students um, every month. Uh, we have great readership of that. It has really uh, interactive uh, videos, um, cooking demonstrations, information that uh, matters to students in the moment, you know, with things like um, how to eat healthy in the dining halls or uh, how to navigate the first round of, of exams uh, for midterms. Next slide, please. We always encourage our students to follow us on social media. We do a lot of our um, prevention and education and marketing through social media because that's where we know our students spend most of their time. So I would encourage you all uh, to follow us as well and that way you can be aware of things that that may be impacting students at the moment or programs that you can encourage your students to participate in um, next slide i believe is the last oh that's on to caps um let's see josh you want me to answer any questions yeah we've got a couple um they, they, you may not be able to answer them so if you don't that's okay we can follow up with um, these individuals uh, they're more for that, I think, the medical services aspect, but we'll see. Um, so the first question is, um, my daughter takes medication for ADHD and will need a doctor at Clemson so that prescription can be filled. Will she be able to use Redfern to receive that care? Um, I'll take a stab at that, and I may ask Burma to, to weigh in as well, because um, because ADHD medications are controlled substances, I think there are some specific criteria uh, for that. But the simple answer is yes, you can have uh, prescriptions for ADHD medication filled in our pharmacy, um, but you do have to um, have met certain criteria. Kimberly or Burma, do you, either one of you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. Uh, due to the fact that most ADHD meds are controlled substances and have to be prescribed you know, once a month, um, the requirement for on campus having a prescriber that uh, having prescriptions come through us, either having a prescription or having somebody at Redfern do the prescribing, is that there has to be an ADHD uh, test battery on file and it has to be have it has to have been done within three years. And so those are kind of specific types of batteries that require um, certain measures to be included on them. There is uh, information and there's a handout on the website. Um, I've tried to put the medical center handout in the chat a few minutes ago. And that information is available on a handout to say, you know, what is specific criteria, it's reviewed. And then after that review, if that review is successful, then yes, the student can obtain those services at Redford. Thanks, Burma, that's, that's, that's helpful. Um, I, I do see there is another uh, question just about general prescriptions being filled at Redfern. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a pharmacy at, at Redfern Health Center. We can fill prescriptions written by our own physicians, and we can also fill prescriptions written by outside um, uh, physicians as well. You can uh, plan ahead and have those prescriptions transferred to, to our pharmacy. Um, and we typically have uh, really competitive prices, both for uh, over-the-counter medication, and then we also take uh, most insurance um, plans for the pharmacy. 
Okay, excellent. Um, another question here is, um, does Redfern have an endocrinologist on staff? Um, we do not. Uh, what we would probably do in that case is a referral. Um, although we are working in partnership with MUSC uh, to potentially be able to do some of those referrals um, through um, telemedicine. So, you know, I think that's an ex a potential for expansion in the future. But but basically, the, the simplest thing would be a referral from Redfern to a local endocrinologist. Okay. All right, excellent. Okay, we um, do need to move on in our, our presentation. Some of the questions that we're getting now, I, I think will be answered in our next section here. Um, and so uh, again, uh, we're gonna get back to these questions if we have time at the end of this session. If not, we will follow up with you individually offline and get you the answers you're, you're, you're seeking here. So with that, we will move along in the, um, our presentation and I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Gaynor. Thank you. So uh, CAPS has been accessible to Clemson students for actually quite a number of years. There's always been mental health services on campus for students. We offer a diverse range of services, uh, diverse uh, levels of interventions, depending on what the student needs are. Because of the volume of students we see, we focus on uh, brief solution focused models. So coming in, if you have sort of an issue or concern for the most part, and we try and, and work with the student to learn how to, to, so they can learn how to you know, deal with their issues in you know, between three and five sessions tends to be our average. Obviously there are some issues that take more than that. And so we have specialists that work in different issues, different programs for that. Uh, we also have uh, self-directed and therapist assisted online services that are available to any student with the .edu account that the students can go in and sort of look for their own information and, and complete modules and things related to substance use or socialization or relationships, anxiety, depression. Um, there are some supplemental mindfulness um, pieces there that I think actually go great with some of Healthy Campus's offerings. Um, we're working on looking at the integrated uh, nature of how we all work together. And so a lot of that just sort of one can lead to the other depending on student needs. Uh, we do al also offer a different set of educational programming, um, theme specific workshops, uh, depending on what the student is looking to acquire or gain. And then we also have skill development groups dealing with being uh, students being taught skills dealing with anxiety and depression symptoms. Next slide. So again, talking about the various modalities, we do individual counseling. We have uh, several groups that are offered throughout the year that some of the groups are general groups and some of them are themed around concerns that students may have. We do couples counseling, uh, and that can include a partner who is not a student, and we can do family counseling. So if a student is coming in and they need the support of their family for the counseling experience, families can come in and present with the student. Uh, we have people who are trained in, in doing that modality as well. We have an on-site psychiatrist full-time, and we have a part-time, half-time um, telepsychiatry through MUSC. And so we are able to serve all the students that are looking to get psychiatric services. There is a fee for that. It's not covered in the health fee, but uh, we are able to get students in. And part of that was because of the weight in the community for psychiatric services. We wanted to be able to, to help students navigate getting medication if they needed it. We operate out of a multicultural model. Uh, diversity is woven through a lot of what we do. We have a very diverse staff. We do diversity training ourselves very often, and then we work with students to, to focus on what their you know, holistic needs are, but then also thinking about if there are any diversity issues that they may need uh, help with. That's our website. There's a ton of information there. Um, again, I posted the, the general medical website, and so you can actually get to all of those uh, various websites through um, that general website, but that's more specific to us. And I think I actually had quite a few questions down. So currently our makeup is we have nine licensed psychologists, nine um, licensed professional counselors. We have one marriage and family therapist. We have a social worker. We have the one psychiatrist on site. We have a one part-time psychiatrist. And we also do training. And so we have a postdoc psychology fellow. So that is someone who has graduated with their doctorate, but is not licensed yet. 
we offer that um, the doctoral level of internship. So that is somebody who is getting their doctorate needs an internship to complete for counseling psychology. And then we have master's level interns. So those who are completing degrees at the master's level and need master's level out master's level hours for their internship. Uh, part of uh, what we do is training. We have a large training component and the site has uh, quite a few training seminars and things uh, that we are looking at ensuring that everyone, staff, trainees and all uh, can make sure that they're keeping you know, up with, with the things that they need to know. We have two support staff. And then um, somebody had asked about the drug and alcohol support. Our part-time licensed professional counselor is actually one of our substance abuse counselors and provides an, uh, a higher level of support for some of the substance abuse issues that, that people may find themselves dealing with. Part of CAPS being a brief therapy model is that we need to refer out for certain types of conditions. If someone is dealing with an issue and they want to come in and talk about it once a week or the treatment is necessary for once a week, we can do that. If somebody needs, um, a higher level of care than that, we work with the student to negotiate where we can get the referrals and how we can get the treatment and do, try to do a soft handoff to ensure that they're getting the care that they need. Um, and we have quite a few referral uh, networks that we utilize to get students to higher levels of care based, based on the presenting need. I think that's the, so currently, our primary mode of service delivery is telemental health. We're currently doing primarily um, telehealth. That will probably change in the fall, um, looking at how Clemson is working on bringing everybody back to campus. So we will be doing a combined in-person and telehealth. Telehealth will still remain uh, because it's helpful for students that don't have ways to easily access campus and still need to access our services. Our current pathway into care is through an initial phone screen, calling the CAPS front desk, uh, and then getting that information to uh, the person on the front, then you get a call back from a therapist who asks some follow-up questions and gets you scheduled for that intake. The phone screen is between five and 10 minutes. The intake itself takes about 45 minutes. There is some paperwork to fill out that we capture some information. Uh, it is very solution focused. So it's what is the need that's presented? How do we feel like we need to come up with a diagnosis for the student? And then look at treatment recommendations. In some cases, individuals is not the best treatment for certain issues. Um, certain socialization concerns and certain anxieties are actually better served in group therapy. And then certain levels of depression or anxiety are better served by learning those skills. And so we recommend different levels of intervention um, depending on going, what's going on with the student and talk to the student about you know, what their needs are and, and how they think they can best be met and come up with sort of a comprehensive collaborative plan. Currently, uh, we are only seeing crisis students and students that have a high level of need in person. Uh, that will probably change by the end of the summer, but again, that's going to depend on uh, what Clemson comes out with in June as far as what the level of on-campus attendance is going to be in the fall. Okay, so Josh, do we want to go into these questions? Yes. Uh, thank you, Burma, for that. So let me uh, start kind of at the top. Maybe do, do you have a on-campus AA group? We do. Um, I do not know. They were not meeting in person this past year, just like most AA groups in this area were not meeting in person. I cannot say whether or not they're going to be meeting in person in the fall without looking at their schedule, but there is a student-centered on-campus AA group that has been operating for several years. Okay, excellent. Um, how can we get a therapist for our student to continue care for anxiety and depression? So looking at that entry point, uh, students do have to call for themselves. We cannot schedule appointments uh, for people who are over 18 unless the person who is wanting the treatment calls and schedules it themselves. But that same entry point calling, we can take those calls between 8 and 4.30 p.m. currently and 8 to 5 uh, during the school year, and they will get scheduled for that intake and then get set up with a clinician for services. Um, okay. Um, is there a cost associated with CAPS? Uh, the only cost associated with CAPS, if somebody is non-healthy paid, is psychiatry. There is a cost for psychiatry, but the CAP services, all of the CAP services otherwise are uh, covered by the health fee. Okay. Let's see here. Um, let me clear that one out of the way. Okay. Um, this may be um, towards you, Burma, um, but what if the student has a prescription for an antidepressant that was made by an out-of-state doctor? What is the procedure for him to be able to get it renewed or filled once he's on campus? 
So if there is an active prescription, that prescription can be transferred. Once that prescription expires, they can actually go one of two paths. Or we can have a student go through the psychiatric care, which again comes at a cost, it's not covered by the health fee. In some cases, uh, our actual physicians on the medical side will also work with some of those types of medications. And so they would enter on the medical side and ask for a, um, a mental health evaluation, and then they can get prescribed medications that way. So we, in, in, depending on what the medication is, there are certain levels of medication that we feel more comfortable with dealing with psychiatry. And so we refer them to psychiatry as opposed to medical, but both sides can prescribe certain medications. Excellent, thank you. Okay, and uh, another question around ADHD, medic ADHD medication is my son takes medication for ADHD. Can I just have him bring his own prescription from home? We could not fill that prescription, but if he's having that prescription managed at home and he's able to manage that medication and bring it with him, that is certainly a viable solution. My suggestion would be certainly to keep uh, records of those prescriptions so that it does not look like it's a substance that he shouldn't have access to, but he can man they can all manage that themselves. And that's for any prescription. If somebody has a prescriber at home and they'd rather not transfer and they're able to get that care, they can certainly maintain that you know, back with their home prescriber as opposed to transferring it to student health services. Okay, excellent. Um, we have answered all the questions either uh, by live or we have responded to them through the text uh, feature of the Q&A box. Uh, are there any other questions? We'll give a, another minute here. Um, okay, uh, we will ask this question um, and this can be for any of our panelists. Um, so is there a place to upload a document with our power of attorney for healthcare? It may not be a question you all can answer. We can. Anybody know that one? So generally students can upload documentation to um, our uh, electronic health record. That would have to be reviewed, however, and I think I'm gonna chunk this part of it to uh, Dr. Poole, but I believe that needs to go through a different review to ensure that it's in uh, a power of attorney that, that Clemson can utilize. Yes, I would say we probably would need, you know, consultation. So that's something if you want to reach out to one of our departmental areas to, you know, like more specific details so we can engage, um, whether it be general counsel or others that would need to give guidance on that. I don't want to speak for Dr. Gaynor, but in general, you know, they are working utilizing a release of information form for students. And so again, this is a very specific request that it would probably be most helpful to review individually. Um, we would not need that in our Office of Advocacy and Success if we're supporting students, or again, it would be that same answer that if you want it to be engaged um, in some way that the student's not readily signing a FERPA waiver for us, you know, we definitely can consult on um, engaging you as needed as well. Excellent. Um, can meetings um, with a nutritionist be scheduled directly or must it be done through one of these programs? Anybody know that one? We can do referrals for a nutritionist, but I believe to have access to the on-campus nutritionist, students can do that on their own. They don't have to do any of us to do that. You can contact directly and they will follow up and schedule me with students. And they're part of the dining services area. Okay, uh, another question related to medication. Um, do I understand it correctly that students can keep meds in their room for asthma and also for anxiety and manage it on their own? So currently the only medications that we would manage are allergy shots. Uh, everything else is expected to be managed by the student. Okay. Um, let's see here. And as you're looking at the questions, I think I would add a follow-up to what Dr. Gaynor said is just in helping your students think ahead about responsibly having that in their space, being aware of who's going in and out just to, um, you know, make sure they have what they need and, um, and you know, just being aware of all that's going on. Um, you know, medicine is very important and helpful and students will self-manage um, and that may be a way that they haven't done on their own before. So maybe having some conversations about what that looks like, where they keep it, um, where they keep their prescriptions, et cetera. Okay. Excellent. Um, let me just, I'm just going through some of these. 
Uh, it is correct that uh, for dietary needs, you can just um, go through the dining hall. You can just, uh, the students can speak to, to folks in the dining, just ask a dining staff member that there are dietary needs and restrictions and uh, the dining staff um, in the dining hall that they're in can, can uh, help address any of those dietary needs. Um, are there any uh, chronic illness support groups that meet or convene on campus for peer support, like type one diabetes, for example? Uh, from our side, we do not currently have any offerings of that nature. Um, as we are always looking to provide new levels of support, if that is something that a need arises for, we would work with uh, health services to see about developing something like that. Sure. Uh, is there a health clinic where students can go to if they are sick? Yes. Um, the third arm of our triumvirate, as I like to say sometimes, is medical services. And again, a lot of those are covered by the health fee. Some things are not uh, testing in, in certain labs. Um, and x-rays are not, but the health fee covers a lot of your general um, sickness visits. Uh, and they are, again, Redfern is uh, sort of in the middle of campus across from um, the Hendrick Center. And so CAPS and the women's clinic. So we do specific um, women's health issues. And then the medical uh, services are all housed in the same building. Okay, and uh, are there any specific programs available for students with uh, type one diabetes? Are there anything offered from Redfern on that front? I feel like there may be some, um, some sort of ways to have those discussions with uh, dining services, but we don't offer anything aimed at that population. Okay. All right, and uh, we, we'll, we'll leave that one unanswered and we'll, we'll try, to, try to provide some more information on that one uh, offline here. Um, is the health fee available to all students, including bridge students? Yes. Um, so, and this might be for more towards Dr. Poole, um, in the event of a medical emergency uh, where our son would need to be transported to a hospital, would we be automatically contacted? If not, could you just assess what we would need to be to do to make sure we are contacted? So that would be, we do have our own um, emergency management service. So we have EMS on campus and if they're being transported from campus, you know, they are providers like your, your local ones. And so within the scope of HIPAA, they would engage and follow up as needed. Also our local hospitals will sometimes contact families um, or emergency contacts. We do not automatically as a university make those notifications. We often don't have all the detail or information, so we would not ever want to be in a situation that we're providing inaccurate health or medical information. I don't know if Dr. Gain or Ms. Gorey can address like if they're going from Redfern, but in general, um, as they share, we are in a full health center as well as separately there is EMS, and so it would all fall under HIPAA there. But you know, in the event of an emergency that you know we are aware and need to engage family as appropriate, we would do that, but there's not an automatic process, nor do we know always of all of the transports that occur. Um, when we are made aware through our Office of Advocacy and Success that there has been a hospital transport, we do try and help follow up with that student to get additional information, make sure they have a plan for a transition back into class. Or again, at that point, as we're gathering more information, you know, assessing the situation that may involve engaging um, others, but that definitely is a case by case process for the notification. Excellent, thank you. Uh, From a mental health perspective, uh, if a student is at risk to themselves and they're being transported, uh, there are certain cases where you're allowed to bypass HIPAA and reach out to their emergency contact uh, to establish connections to help engage in care for that student. Um, that is not all the time. It really depends on the level of concern that we have for the student who is being transported. Um, from the medical side, those decisions to contact family are made from a different place. Um, they have different ways that they have to adhere to the rules. And so EMS will make this at the hospital to make the decision, EMS to make the decision. Uh, but we do not usually on the medical side contact parents if a student is being transported from, from medical reasons from, uh, the, from uh, the health center. Excellent. Um, is Redfern open on the weekends during the school year? No. Um, that would be a interesting staffing proposition. And so we do have urgent care, uh, the virtual crisis lines that are available. 
Um, and we do have, and I, I didn't talk about this, we have an on-call for psychological emergencies as well that is available anytime the building is closed, you can still reach a counselor. And so you have uh, nurses care that's available through an on-call system and then uh, mental health care that's available through an on-call system. There on our the homepage of the health center, I haven't been able to figure out how to put this into the chat exactly. There is a, a lot of information about what to do after hours, uh, MUSC virtual urgent care, um, local um, urgent care facility. So uh, that is that that information is available on the homepage. And if I could put it in a chat, I would. But Right. Um, are there any other questions? We have another about a minute or two before we wrap up. So follow up with the statement uh, that was made by um, Ms. White. Uh, if a student comes in and they fill out a release of information and Redfern has particular releases of information that we utilize um, that are not necessarily standard for other places. So um, if somebody uh, wanted to come in and provide that at the point of entry and have it done every year, we do not keep them on file for say four years, they need to be done every year and updated. Then if there was a situation where a parent or emergency contact would need to be contacted, we'd have the release on file already and that could, could, that could certainly be done. But that just, that has to happen ahead of time. Uh, for us to be able to do that. But some parents do certainly come in and if they have a student who they know has a health issue or concern but may not be able to reach out to them or they are wanting to you know, be a part of the student's care, then the student will fill out a release ahead of time. And I will say that the HIPAA releases and the FERPA releases do not cover the same information. So sometimes students will fill out information for access to academic information. It does not cover anything on the mental health or medical side. And those are, so those are two separate forms. And as a follow-up, that's actually what I was going to share. Um, the Office of Advocacy and Success, we're here because we are able to support connecting students to issue, um, you know, different resources, including health and wellness related, and we're supporting them through that journey. We are not a medical center or providing clinical services of any type. So we are operating under um, FERPA, which you knows the Privacy Act related to education. And maybe you're hearing about it in another session, I'm not sure. And so again, though, that student can um, choose to sign a release so that as needed for different situations, we can engage, but we actually are not you know, the direct recipients, if you will, or treat, you know, treatment providers related to health or medical. We are, um, again, as um, Alana shared, we are that connector, we're an entry point for them to get to those services. All right, excellent. Um, all right, so just a couple of closing more remarks as we wrap up today. Um, I wanna thank our presenters for taking the time to meet with you all today and sharing this information. I'll also say that a lot of the information, the websites and the resources we've actually posted in our Clemson Parent and Family Experience Portal. Uh, there's content posts there uh, as a part of the 2021 Parent and Family Orientation. We encourage you to get in there and check that out. You can find a lot of the detailed information um, uh, that, that may not necessarily have been covered here from like medical services to health fee coverage, prescriptions, medical insurance, all that good stuff will all be provided there. Um, it's all been dropped in there this week. Uh, we do encourage you to take uh, to have your students take advantage of these resources. They are here, they are available, they are wonderful folks, wonderful staff ready to assist and help to make sure the Clemson experience is as best as it can be. As we mentioned in the opening, student well-being is a critically important um, aspect of being successful in the classroom and out of the classroom so they can persist to get to that all-important day of graduation. Um, so we encourage you to, to, to encourage your students to take advantage of, of these resources. Um, I want to thank you all for attending today. It was a pleasure having you. Uh, we will be, as I mentioned earlier, the recording of this will be available in the next uh, few business days um, in the parent portal, as well as on our website, uh, so that you can reference it back in the event that you need to. Of course, it'll also be available for those who were not able to join us today. I want to invite you to our next Tiger Talk, which is on June 8th at 7 p.m. Uh, this is where uh, members of our Clemson Family Advisory Board, who these, these folks are uh, current parents and family members of our current students, and they're going to be sharing kind of uh, their perspective of the Clemson experience from the from the uh, from a parent's perspective, uh, sharing you lessons learned, tips and strategies to navigate the Clemson experience. So hope you can join us uh, for that one um, on June 8th. 
As always, you're welcome to reach out to us at CU Families at Clemson.edu. We are here to help and support. We know that this is a, um, an anxious time as your student is transitioning to campus. It's a new chapter in their life. We're here to help and support in any way we can. So feel free to reach out to us for any questions that you may have. Um, and with that, I hope everybody has a great evening. Um, and until we meet again, go Tigers. <laughs>